Look up in the sky at the birds that play. It's- Jason J. Lewis, the voice of Superman on Justice League Action. And you're listening to The Krypton Report. Welcome to The Krypton Report Podcast. The only podcast that gets to feature the likes of me and James together. That's a lot of handsomeness for one podcast. Just playing. It's just me and James. I'm your host, Tyler, the Superman of Blue. Uh, the man of tomorrow, and I am trying to make myself laugh because it's just been a stressful time in life. Uh, and with me, as always, is my co host, Mr. James Superman Red, the man of steel. Cole, what's up, buddy? What's going on? You are a handsome man, Tyler. <laughs> uh, I'm just trying to make myself giggle. Oh, really <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, everything that's been going on, you need some extra laughs, it's all good. Whether you got to make yourself laugh or comes from elsewhere. <laughs> yes, it does. Yes, it does. But uh, so <laughs> we're going to kick off the show with this little statement. I have no news. No news. No news. <laughs> no news. Um, uh, news. Well, I mean, there is the, the, the news that Watchmen Part 1 has come out. Um, yeah, Watchmen I have Part One. To watch that, so we can talk. About I did watch it, and I, I guess I liked it. Um, and I say that weirdly, like I watched it. and I don't have anything against it. I just was sitting there watched with Jania, thinking like, I think the Watchmen movie has done so well to the book, except for you know not using the squid. Um, and that would all. And there's a few small things in the book that I that I wish they had hit on in the movie, like just kind of some statements. Um, there's the great line, in the book where Dr. Manhattan basically tells Ozzy that this won't last. Everything comes back around and it was all for nothing kind of thing. And all the stuff like that all falls in the latter half of the book. So that would be part two of the film. Um, but it's just, it's just interesting. Like it has a great voice cast, like Titus Welliver, but then you don't know it's Titus Welliver's Rorschach because he's doing his Rorschach voice. Um, and I just, I just, I think Jack Euro Haley just knocked out of the part with his Rorschach voice. So, so there's just some stuff in it where I'm like, okay, this is good, but I, I really like the Watchmen film. The right. Black Freighter well, stuff is interested in the way they incorporate it in the animated film. Oh, it's in there. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. And because I, I've actually never watched the the ultimate with the Black Freighter in it. I'm good without it. Um, I've I, never I, watched I the, the ultimate. Ulti- uh, whatever the Blu-ray. Extended. The ultimate that has it. So I've watched the Black Freighter cartoon on its own when they released it as a DVD on its own. I've never watched it where they've edited it into the film, which is like the extended ultimate cut or whatever. Cause I find the black freighter works, I guess better for me reading the book. Um, Usually when I reread it, I actually sk- skip the black freighter stuff anymore. Sometimes I have. Um, and some, sometimes I've done a deep dive where I've read the black freighter and all the um, under the hood stuff, you know, but it just it just kind of depends on my mood. But yeah, Watchmen's out there. Well, either way, any way you read it, it's still a long book. Yeah. <laughs> but we are going to review today. Our first up is we're going to talk about Superboy, episode six. Now, our last time we talked Superboy, episode four. And if you're thinking, what the heck, Tyler and James? Um, that's because when we did start talking Superboy, We talked about how episode five, Countdown to Nowhere, was originally supposed to be the pilot. So as we went through it, we did it first as if it was the pilot because it makes the show make sense. Um, Now, I will say this episode, I watched it um, with Solomon. We were sitting there. I was folding some laundry and he sat with me and watched it. It was cool because he got into it and was asking questions about it. So it's been kind of cool. He was asking me some questions I couldn't really answer. He's like, who's this guy? What's this? I'm like, dude, there is no really known villains in this first season. Okay. I'm like, you just kind of got to roll with it. 
but the it's called bringing down the house a rock star judd faust wants the amusement park and puts everyone in danger when the owner refuses to sell it to him lana falls in love with judd but learns of his true nature when he takes her away one night and puts her in a torture device that is a horrible description because that completely gives away the twist of this you know um so i so leif garrett is judd um 80s rocker leif garrett so that was a nice little cameo surprise right. yeah probably a nice but, little get at the time but i was i was like actually digging this episode because i thought it was kind of neat just the whole theme park and the baseball and like you're seeing around florida and clark's interactions with things and i was like this is kind of cool and then it does this huge twist out of nowhere where that basically spoils it where judd's actually the creepo behind everything and then we find out he actually murdered three women and buried them under his house at the <laughs> end so all of a sudden you know he's he talks about he likes collections shows off his house then all of a sudden uh you know, he goes to take Lana into his torture chamber. He likes to t- collect screams. And the episode just took a dark turn. And then they're like, what about the others? And uh, what do you call it? Clark's like, they found him. Police found him under his house. <laughs> right. I was just uh, like, holy crap. Yeah. This, this one went off the rails in the last couple of minutes. <laughs> um. Uh, yeah, definitely with his little dungeon there. Uh, took a turn pretty quick. And I mean, you see that dungeon at on TV, you know, that's like it's like satanic worship. You know what I, I mean? I was like, is it about to go BDSM? Like, do I got to like have my son leave the room? <laughs> I'm like, it's a super boy. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, so, yeah, quick, quick turn, quick, twi- uh, quick turn. I mean. As soon as uh, as soon as he came in and said it was his manager, I pretty much expected him to be involved. So I thought the manager was trying to set him up one of those like I did it for you to boost your career type things, you know, but. No. It did not go that way. No, sir. <laughs> but I was like, dang. Yeah, um, but Clark just straight up goes down in the field. Calls himself in as the pitch hit the pinch hitter and freaking whacks a, a home run up into the sky so a bomb can detonate way up in midair. Just walks out on the field and does it. <laughs> and and they know it's Clark. That's what was crazy. It wasn't like he swooped in as Superboy. They're like, is that Clark? You know, and yeah. always he has no glasses on, but he has a hat on. I actually uh, thought Superboy was gonna come in and like catch the ball and just like Flak jacket, the 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 the, the bomb, good you old, know, <laughs> good old Superboy. Um, I don't know. I, I like I said, I was digging this whole episode till like the end, and then I was like, "What the f- did I just watch?" <laughs> um, um, no, I mean it was the whole episode was fine, and I mean, yeah, it took a weird turn there at the end, but. They they already clearly involved him as soon as he hung up the phone. Mm-hmm. So it was like, well, he's got to be something more evil here at the end. Didn't have that much time left. Yeah. Um, I I told Solomon's we're watching it. I really like John Hames Newton's Clark Superboy. The more I watch it, like. I like his friend. I think he's my favorite Superboy. Out of the well, two. I will certainly see, you know, I got the rest of this season to finish. And then, you know, after, after we finish this one, we'll go to season three. And I'll see some more of Gerard's and we'll... I'll get a little back and forth to see to see how it how it goes. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, yeah, as Clark is this, this Clark is not as as Reeve like. You know? Um, so Gerard gets better in like seasons three and four, but I, I like what John's doing. So, all right, that was Superboy. It was a fun, adventurous. Uh, yeah, episode. adventures with Superboy, and it had a different opening. Yeah, it felt a little different, but I was like, did they tweak it? But the next thing we're going to talk about. So we're now going to talk about making sure that as an aging male, you're getting checked at the doctors. Use promo code James for 10% off your next doctor's. (laughs) Promo code. (laughs) Yeah. For your next turn and cough physical, right? (laughs) There you go. (laughs) All right. (laughs) But here we go. Here we go. Seriously, we're going to be talking about the New 52 Superman in action comics. And as we brought up before, we're doing it this way as just an interesting step into the writing process. But the first volume of action comics, as collected on the DC app, uh, says DC Comics took us a bold step and renumbered their longest running monthly comic action comics to number one. For the first time since 1938, as part of the DC Comics The New 52 event. With this re uh, numbering comes a new creative team featuring comics legend Grant Morrison and fan favorite Rags Morales. While Morrison is no stranger to writing Superman character, having won three Eisner Awards for his work on All Star, Action Comics will be something new for, bold, for both old and new readers and presents humanity's first encounters with Superman before he became one of the world's greatest superheroes. Said a few years in the past, it's a bold new take on a classic hero. Collects action comics one through eight. All right. Just quick. And look, look, I'm wearing my shirt. Oh, nice. Nice. Yeah. (laughs) It's an awesome cover, by the way. It is. It's also, it's also a great cosplay. Yeah. Easy cosplay and uh yeah, uh you know, for for a a modern retelling of like the golden age of Superman coming from Grant Morrison, it's actually pretty freaking awesome. So I'm gonna say this just before we go into I like this interpretation of a younger Clark Superman here. I like his attitude. I like what he's doing. You said it's definitely like the golden age where he's, you know, um, fighting for the downtrodden. Uh, I really like what he's doing. Oh yeah. He's going after, um, he's going after corrupt people. He's fighting for the people who can't fight for themselves. Like you said, the downtrodden, they talk about how, Uh, A woman is being abused and Superman got involved. Um, And yeah, it's very uh, some of the things that they that they reference is some of the earliest stuff. If you read like Action Comics number one. Mm hmm. It also. um, What do you call it? The. uh, Oh, um, with George Taylor. So as the editor of the Daily Star. Yes. Yes. And he works at the Daily Star, not the Daily Planet. Yep. Because the Daily Planet is their rival. So it does go um, hit on some things like that. I do want to say that as we go through action, we will we will mention, but we will skip over and not re-review um, tie-in issues that we talked about during the Hell on Earth event, as well as the... Um, um doomed event so just wanted to bring that up so there'll be a nice little probably chunk here we'll just have to go through it and be more cautious as we go through it here well it'll be interesting because we read it with the volume like we didn't read like the hell on earth storyline so we missed some of those other little issues you know reading it just from that superman because there's, there's one hell on earth 
or two. But there's I'm not sure you got farther in in reading action. This well, week no, I'm, the, I'm just so. I'm just looking at the. There's one official. Uh, yeah, Krypton Returns Part One is an annual for the Hell on Earth tie-in. Uh, I'm just looking at the list. So through he, through the numbering, but we're gonna start with Action Comics number one, and I will say for the first issues, I really like it. Um, but then it gets a little confusing um, as we go into volume two, because I read both volumes. I got a little excited, but we'll start with volume one. <laughs> because one of our things we talked about with Superman is there was no Lex Luthor. And um, this is where Lex Luthor is, is over here in action. Like, I like this cover here. But I, you know, a lot like that's one of my favorite Jim Lee Superman drawings. But I think this one's the better, um, okay. because because yeah. this Superman for this past for when it starts, you know, is supposed to be very much just the cape and t-shirt. Makes a great cosplay, great cosplay. Hmm. Hmm. What I loved about this Superman, and then the one we have later when we get into. The truth is it basically was me just dressed for work every day. Jeans and a Superman t-shirt. Best cosplay right. ever. Yeah. So here so here sounds we go. Sounds like my sounds like all my weekend attire. Exactly. <laughs> it's very rare if you find me without a Superman shirt. So um but here we go. So it starts off and I I like this formatting for comics. Like I just I I'll, I'll, maybe I'm a little old school in it, but you know we got six or five panels on here, and just the way it's done, more blocks compared because it also makes it easier for app reading too. Because like, have you some of that where the books are really crazily drawn and that you know trying to do the app like the digital reading um, makes it difficult. Uh, yeah, it does. Um... Depending on how it is, you know, you get a really long thing and the words are still small in the middle, you know, or it's really small because it's such a thin one across the way, uh, you know, uh, horizontally when you're holding it vertically. <laughs> so the first issue is called Superman versus the City of Tomorrow, and we have him busting into Mr. Glenn Glenn Morgan's uh, apartment. The police are all there, and he's standing on the edge. And so he says, and I like how there's the <laughs> Glenn Morgan yelling, somebody save me. Yeah, right. <laughs> and almost, I almost sung it. It kind of came through in my head. And we see Superman basically fall. He like, takes a step off the roof and lands on his like basically feet because he can't fly yet. He can just jump. And I, what I like is where he say he's he's more aggressive, and that's very golden age, you know, where he's like, no, nobody's so big, they can't be taken down a peg or two. I can keep this up as long as you like, Mister. You deal, you know the deal, Metropolis. Treat people right, or expect a visit from me. And then we have a really good something they do in this book that I really like is the effect of like shading his eye blue. To show that he's using his x-ray vision. Right. That is something that they uh, have have been doing now. Um, it's, it's a common thing when they're doing x-ray vision in comics these days. How, let me ask you this as we go through this. How do you feel about the art in this book? <clears throat> From um, Rags Morales. You know, for the most part, I like the art in, in this book. Um, a lot of it's very kinetic, you know, it's very action. I love the art. The only thing I can say in a sort of negative is there are times that he draws Superman. His face doesn't match the way his face shows up like in the next panel. Like 
it's not that it doesn't look the same face or same Superman. And then when he draws Clark, at, at sometimes he'll draw Superman in a panel where he looks more older and manly. And then he'll draw him later where he looks more childlike and super boyish and smaller. So I, and I'll kind of point it out as I go, but we do get Luther who's much more of a, how would you describe this Luther? He's, Old, he seems um, like he's older. He, he looks you know. older. He he's definitely a little rounder in the face. Yeah. Um, and and then the way he talks, especially later on, is very um, almost Gene Hackman like. Which I feel like, man, I feel like there's a difference between homage, callbacks, ripoffs. And I feel like we live in such a time where people are continuing properties, but everybody wants to move backwards too and do callbacks. And I'm just, I don't know. I'm at a point where I don't need callbacks. I don't need you to redo something or, you know, like do something a little bit more original. I don't need you to redo lines of dialogue or certain things, but yeah. Homages instead of, instead of just straight ripoffs dialogue especially is a very heavy one these days uh you know i mean that was that's all that's half of what keaton did in the flash <laughs> was repeat lines he said before and you know you people are like oh he said it. i'm like okay that's great you know it's like i don't need like people like how many times have we seen them try to make comments of like gene hackman style lex luther with like the land deals or whatever, or yeah, Miss I mean, Tessmacher. Right. I feel in this one though, I mean, it's very referential, but they definitely didn't use any lines from Gene Hackman. So I felt it was more homage like than, than just um, repeating lines Gene Hackman delivered. I will um, say that, that, you know, we have Lex Luthor here what, monitoring Superman with Sam Lane. And we see them starting to wreck a um, like an apartment building. There's a bunch of people in it, and Superman stops the wrecking ball and gets hit with a massive like tank cannon and like an electric net. And then he just because t- they're you know testing his limits, and then he slams the wrecking ball against the tank, saves the people. And here comes the police. And we see him kind of leap onto his roof and then grab some laundry that's on the roof and put on his glasses and a big oversized sweater. And then this is what I'm talking about. Like, he looks like a big dude in a sweater, right? Then you turn the page and the way they draw him with the baskets, like he's really small. But then the bottom corner, he looks like he's like the Hulk or something. And then... Just little cons- inconsistencies with the way he's drawn. He seems like his body size is big or small or big and small. Right. Yeah, but, the, the picture on the top of one of the pages in the top panel, he just he almost looks like a teenager with a laundry basket. Right, and that's what I'm talking about. And He pays his landlord, you know. Um, Miss Nixley. Yeah. Miss Nixley. And then I, I, you know, what's interesting is this is like, he's, he calls on the phone. He's friends with Jimmy Olsen and Lois Lane. They're friends. But Jim says his best friend for like six months, Clark Kent. Yeah. But you know, Lois and Jimmy are at the daily planet. Clark's at the daily star, but we don't actually get to know how they met. We're just they're You know, so I, I kind of was like, huh. But then they're on a train, and Clark told them not to be on a train. And then he takes off because the train has a bomb on it. And basically, Superman saves and stops the train, but the impact of the bullet train in him stopping it basically crushes him into the Daily Planet, which is funny. 
and pins him in. And Lex Luthor makes a comment about you wanted Superman dead or alive. There he is. I gave him to you. And General Lane's pissed because Lois was on the train. Oh, well, I mean, a lot of people were put in danger, but yeah, of course, Lois was on the train. So I actually were put in danger and a lot of collateral damage. I actually have this issue one, like in single issue. Um, I I found it at a uh, it was a Fruth drugstore. When I was working, I had to take uh one of my clients to the time to get his medication, and they had like a comic spinner rack, and I saw Action Comics one, that, and I was like, oh, I'm just gonna pick this up. Well, oh, that is awesome. But I don't have. I think it's the only one I have, like of the run. I think I have the trade paperback of this. Um, but I'm just pulling up with my app. And then so here we go with issue two. And they have Superman in an electric chair. And I mean, the art is great because he looks so powerful. I do think it's funny the pants that he chose to be his unofficial, like pants, like some patchwork jeans. Right. Almost like some worker jeans. Yeah. And then we have Dr. Irons. Um, and Sergeant Corbin. And both of them look a lot older than I would expect right here. And Dr. Irons leaves. He quits. We see that they're shooting the crap out of his cape. And what's interesting is the art yet has has not yet filled in the black on the back of the cape. It's just outlined. Just the black S in the shield. Yeah. Because it's not even, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's not even the solid black that we'll get here soon. Um, Lois shows up. Talking to her dad. <laughs> and then Lex has his whole theory that Clark is a shape-shifting alien. Not, and he's just in a, looking like a human who's in his form. And there's like a dead cow goat looking thing. Hmm. He says, uh. Isn't this one of your kind? It's natural state. And Clark just starts laughing. And Lex gets so mad. It's like shock him. And he says, um, I like this line, except my eyes don't just absorb radiation like yours do. They emit all kinds like the microwave that I just cooked your equipment with. Hmm. And we see all their computers don't work. And we see like, Okay, if you're on the page of Lois and Corbin, where she's trying to get into the the facility, on the left side, her face is all scrunched up and looks weird, like she's constipated. The bottom, she looks like almost a completely different person. And Corbin looks like he's an old dude pretending he's young, pretending to be Ted Lasso. (laughs) So Uh. I think... I think Rags has great art, but I think he has some trouble with faces and faces and facial continuity. Because, yeah. I mean, that Lois looks like she's like a, I'm not telling. I'm throwing a fit. Yeah. yeah that is that is what I get from that picture. Um, and then <clears throat> I mean, she's being she's being very much ignored by her father right now. So it almost fits, though. Yeah. I mean, it, and I'm not hating on Rags. You're an amazing artist. You do so much better than I could ever. So I will never put you down. I'm just pointing out some stuff as we're just kind of talking about this. I do like your stuff. Art is something I wish I could do. But Superman, you know, got to catch his breath and breaks out of the chair. Um, you know, he stands up. He has Lex. He wants his cape back. He gets his cape and he's trying to get out of there and he keeps seeing some call to him and it's his ship. And his ship is calling to him. And we get little scenes of like where he's like bleeding or has a little bit of blood coming out of him on his like around his mouth and his ears at times on the beating he's taken because he's not yet as powerful as he will become because right now this action comics is like five years in the past compared to where we are in Superman. So it's going to be interesting when we, when they kind of sync up, you know? Yes. Yes. 
they do a quick um really awesome panel of like him with his heat vision where he will see he kind of like whips it in circles when he cuts their guns and sets them on fire and i do like how he says i guess you guys didn't hear me the first time around i'm leaving and he's just like walking out and they're like attacking him and shooting him and he's like just walking out any way that he can and then he runs into lois at the elevator and then we have corbin showing up to find his metal suit that he's trained for the metal zero And then we, at the end of it, we have Luther on the phone talking to somebody. And he says, what are you? Um, and there's this big ship in this space. So how do you feel about issue two? Um, you know, some pretty cool stuff. Uh, I mean, I liked, <clears throat> I liked him being in the chair. Um, I love the way he laughed, especially once, you know, once you read through the whole thing, you see how it comes back. He's laughing at the the alien in its natural state. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it makes me actually wonder if he ever got told that story. I think he did. Because because if, if he did, it, like this could make you laugh even harder. So. In issue three, he's having like dream flashbacks to Krypton. And it's a very different looking Krypton. Um, but when we do get to see is we get to see a very, ooh, excuse me, beastly crypto. And we see jor And we see that what we can speculate and we are later, we do discover. Like I'm just going to spoil this part. I don't care. One of my favorite things about the New 52 and I wish that this was done in a Superman film is I love that his cape was actually jor cape. The jor actually takes off and wraps the baby in when putting him in the rocket. Yeah, and jor and jor says that it was his father's cape. So it's this lineage thing, and it's an actual cape and not a blanket. It's something of his father, because if you notice, like, you know, it's actually Kryptonian fabric. It's tied around him right here um, because he's wearing the T-shirt and it's not actually part of his suit later. It tucks, you know, to his suit. So that's something that I really have liked about just the interaction in the New 52 with um, Jarrell. But now we're back to Clark in his apartment. Even his round glasses are very early Clark Kent that we saw in the Golden Age. And this is like some of this right here. Like this is what I'm talking about. Like the different faces. Like the. The. Panel of him standing in his shirt. And his socks and everything. He looks so small. And so young. Yeah. And then. Like his face a, looks so sunken in almost. Yeah. The chin. And, and just like, you know, he's being harassed by the police for his story and his stuff. And then he may, I mean, there is the, 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 he cracks some wise right here where he says, I'm a writer. The pen is, the pen is mightier than the sword uh, and way easier to lift. And he's like holding his arm up like this. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, his landlord. So, so what's all this about? You're from outer space. And she hands him his shirt and cape. And then we just kind of cut to Jimmy and Clark together talking about things about where Glenn, Glenn Morgan of CEO of galaxy Inc, you know, is on the news and Clark gets a call from Icarus who gives him tips to help with his story. Of course, Superman saves a cat from a tree and stops the truck. Like, okay, I'm sorry, but this just feels like ignorant Superman. Okay. He, you know, the girl's standing there to get her cat and he breaks the truck. Instead of just like moving the girl. 
but it is a weird panel setup because it's like she he stops the truck the cat comes in his arms he hands the girl the cat she's screaming then people are throwing bottles and bricks at him and then Amelia goes to him with his shirt and boots and stuff in the trash it's just I don't know it's just some weird layout stuff but I think it has to do something with what's revealed later. I listened to Grant Morrison talk about it years ago, like over a decade ago. So we have Clark showing up where Lois and Jimmy are doing an interview with the owner. I'm looking for his name. Um, they build robots. And Clark's basically there to talk about all the job loss and everything. And the person's mad because... He's like, I thought this was an interview about me and business. And then all of a sudden robots start attacking. Trying to talk him up as a successful businessman. And then we go and we see John sitting now in the suit of Metal Zero. And it's fusing with him. He's like, I spent five years training for this. You don't... uh, think i'm ready and we see like the way it plugs like basically into his brain what do you think of this like metallo pre-metallo thing we got going on here um i mean it it is an interesting setup that they have um it's kind of cool them like designing this suit lex for the military designing this suit to to fight and kill superman uh so I think it's I think it's pretty cool. Like I'm I'm not opposed to uh Corbin being like a military guy who through various circumstances and probably some of his own uh uh crap uh behaviors <laughs> mm-hmm. that he's that he kind of deserves what's coming to him, but um I mean it's it's a it's probably a little over designed right now like looking at it as as you sw- go through from page to page like all of the um all of the fibers and stuff running up up it yeah um I do think it's interesting how Brainiac is already in control of it though Right. As soon as he plugs in, like, and we don't even have like a sense of how Brainiac got here. But yeah, not yet. John is overtaken. And he says, then where is Superman? And the next issue, hold on, I got to back up. Where I read this. Before. Well, we kind of get it where where Lex Luthor says, "Welcome to Earth." You and I made a bargain, remember? So, like, <laughs> shows you smarmy Lex right away. I mean, he's smarmy. Like he is. Like like the way they draw him, he is smarmy, and like, I don't. know, He's not a tough guy at all. So we have all these robots coming, and we see. John Henry at his home. And then we see Superman. He's wearing a white t-shirt. With, you know, his symbol. And once again, there's some shots. (laughs) There's some panels drawn where Superman looks much older in his face. But basically, it's chaos until Corbin shows up. We have the Lois tries to talk to him. He wants to fight with Superman, but he doesn't have the kryptonite heart yet. That's a big thing we have to we have to talk about. No, when the um, when Brainiac kind of took him over, uh, his his heart exploded. Mm -hmm. So he doesn't have a heart at all. Um, but so Superman is getting you know attacked by Corbin, and then all of a sudden Superman all take care of this, Doctor Irons, and boom, we have our first 
introduction of steel, which is very much, he has a slimmer, smaller looking suit to the same one that Corbin has. And I, it, it feels weird how like the arms are like steel circular, almost like it's looking like muscle fiber muscle, you know? Yeah. Um, it's very weird for the, for the armor. <clears throat> But we see, yeah. I mean, I, I guess it's probably supposed to look a little just more organic in nature. I guess. So steel starts battling Metallo, and then something is going on around the city, and we see what who we named as the Collector. Now this is a version of Brainiac. I would say, like in the physical body. Yeah. It's not the Brainiac yet. Because we have Clark say, they're not dead. I can hear them. I've got an idea, but I need your help. And we see, like, smoke. And then we get our first backup, which is like a history of Heart of Steel. And it's like the history, a little bit of John Henry. And then it's it's basically the battle of him and Metallo. And how he tells Metallo, I defeated you because I built the suit and uh, put a thumb drive with a virus in it that destroyed the armor. And he calls himself, I'm a steel driving man. Yeah. Um, and for me, that backup wasn't until much later. Yeah. That's the thing is if you're looking, if you're reading it in the course of. What do you call it? If you're reading them in the course of the trade, the yeah. backups all come together at the end. Now, as we're doing this here, I'm doing issue by issue, and it's, it's oh, uh, are you okay? Yeah, and it's it's different. Oh yeah, that is different. So now, like we're on issue five, right? And issue five it starts with opening up at Krypton, and we see how because I, I like I like the backups. Um, so do I. So do yeah, I. I want to. They probably would have been better to read issue to issue that way. Then um, I, I think I'm going to do that the, from now on, right? Because maybe. The issue because issue five, basically the first part of issue five is like stuff that happened on Krypton, where he launched and we saw how crypto gets pulled into the Phantom Zone, stopping criminals from escaping. We see how John Kent talk ha, the military shows up, and he says, "I think I found me a spaceman," and it's the goat calf thing wrapped up and then it cuts to you know where we are now they where they found the ship and then how clark's there touching the ship um and yeah i like i like the story almost from the ship's point of view the time and everything and then how it goes to sleep and then it wakes back up when Clark re, uh, finds it again when he's when he's grown when he's yep. now Superman. But then um, this is where I get confused. A, um, where like it jumps to a Doom level three world. And it's like the ship's turning chrysalis, and then we have um these people show up and steal the Kryptonite engine. And their their things are done in purple, red, blue, and green. And then um, we see it's Superman and three members of the Legion. And it says, without it, I am doomed to die. And what happens? So too dies the Earth. It is like the first issue of this where I said, what the hell just happened? <laughs> because I, like this is such a chopped up issue of from where it starts with Krypton to the little thing with the Kents, you know, part of it, part of them finding the baby, because then later we'll get a backup that tells more of that story. And then this whole thing with the Legion. And then this one has the right here, the yeah. baby steps, which I think is a great backup. I mean, this is probably one of the best. And it's about Jonathan and Martha getting married. And then her having failed pregnancy tests and then being confronted with the option of in vitro fertilization and trying hormones and all the money they invest. 
and then nothing's working. And then how John, you know, Jonathan never gives up hope. Like he talks about licensing the farm and how they're going to get money and just, you know, they want to be parents and what they can do. And then we see the rocket coming, but uh, it was, I just, I don't know, like some of that stuff, I almost wish they would just incorporate that in the story and not do it as like a backup. Right. Because um, it's kind of alluded to a little bit. And then like, yeah, go ahead. Oh, <laughs> uh, well, I was going to say something about the book. I thought you were done with the backups there. No, you're going to go. Um, before we move on to the next issue, the, the issue here, I like the way that they kind of, uh, the machines are building machines, building robots, building the terminots. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, it's very classic. It's very golden age and, and Fleischer related where one of these, where he's fighting off a, a, a army of robots and, and tying it to the collector this way furthers that story. And then tying in John Corbin that way furthers creating another villain. It's true. It's very well, you know, I love the way it, it builds the world, uh, the way that it builds the world around Superman in his early days. This next issue, issue six, this is one of those, like, this is definitely a Grant Morrison thing. Cause I'm just like, what is going on? Um, and I'm still like, what? where is the story that we left off with? And basically what we're dealing with is, I kind of feel like I have to summarize it, but it's Superman from five years in the future coming to the past to stop them. And what we find out is that there is basically a bullet capsule of their Tesseract space inside Superman's brain. And it has... Um, this kryptonite engine in it. <laughs> and then um, Emra has to go and get it. And then we get a really cool, you know, Clark wrestling a bull in the past, but it's like a memory with issues because he's talking about the barn and we basically see what's inside his mind. And there's this person that keeps popping up that later will be revealed to be somebody we'll talk about later. And the thing, the capsule gets busted. And, you know, he's poisoned with kryptonite. He's screaming and and he's basically, the ship needs kryptonian radiation. So Clark struggles to get to the ship, saves the ship. And then, um, you know, they're like, okay, Clark, it's safe. And then the ship saves him. And then the Legion saves Clark. <laughs> yeah. Saves Superman. And then, you know, they, they, we see this nice flashback to when the Legion met Clark as a, as a kid. And they talk about how disappointed they were in him because he was just this kid. Um, and that's the last page. And I was just like, this issue was weird. Uh, but I do so like was this, this back- like an annual, like in reading in a different order? No, this is, this is just the next issue. Like oh so what? this was just okay because this this issue that you're talking is the last issue in the trade. The trade should be up to issue eight because it has list it has listed on the trade, uh, issue issues one through eight is what's on the app trade. No, I I I'm I know it's one through eight. I'm saying that this issue with the, the oh well, it, it, Superman people and the Tesseract yeah, space in his brain. They the moved last it. Ish- yeah, it's the last issue in the trade because they moved them <laughs> out of order, and that's what I'm saying. Like this is how stuff gets, how we get pissed off, because you know they wrote this, but then they shift stuff around. So we're just going to do it issue by issue. I think <laughs> because this this is why people get met. This is why I get frustrated with comics. Is because you write stuff convoluted, you change the order. 
you know, and if you look in the trade, it doesn't tell you what issue number you're on or anything. But the last backup on this is Clark Kent giving his farm in his house, the Kent farm, to another farmer who had lost his house and farm because Clark's moving to the city and both the Kents are dead. And he says, you know, take a look around. And it's just kind of Clark going through the house, reliving memories of growing up there on the farm with Pete and Lana. And I do think it's weird that he only takes like one picture off the wall and just leaves like pictures of his parents married and him as a baby in someone else's house now. <laughs> right. But it's then like, please so, take everything down and box it up and store it nicely for us. Okay. So now like we jump back to we are now at issue seven, which is where we left off previously with City in the Bottle. And we have Clark um with like a breather on wearing his torn shirt and pants and he takes off running. His shoes are falling apart. He's running so fast, hits a flatbed and catapults himself into space. And that's when he lands on the ship. So he literally jumps into space. Yep. Take that (laughs) leap over a building in a single bound. It says, competent for you... So he sees the robots that are all still controlled by Brainiac. It says, compensate for Yellow Sun super endowments. Target and neutralize. He sees uh, different bottle cities. He sees um, this is a place from... This is the place from my dreams. I've seen these clothes before. And he's touching a white suit that has a circle on it and everything. Then we're back in the, the bottled city with Lex Luthor and Jimmy and Lois. They're in a bar with Glenn Morgan while Lex whips out his cell phone. And there's a mysterious bartender who gives Glenn Morgan a tie. And we will see how that plays out later. Hmm. But Superman, you know, basically gets attacked and has to make a decision to save the bottled city of Earth or the bottled city of Krypton. So what does Superman do? He decides that it's best to break glass and take off his shirt. (laughs) And he he grabs the fabric. And I kind of wish they did this better because he's holding the fabric and it's white. And then when he puts it on, like what we see is we see him holding it. And the next thing he has it on and he's connecting his cape to it. And like the way they colored it is it's white on the bottom, but it's turning into the blue and red. And we now have the Superman shield on him. Um, I wish it had just been different because we do know that this is a becomes a nanotech suit once it's on him. Yeah. Um, so we now have Bra- you know, uh, the collector told him that it was an indestructible armor. It's indestructible, you say. Um, and now we have him facing the collector who has uh, Corbin attached to him. But then once again, we have an awesome backup. Like I really love the art and color for the backup. And it's steel in the meanwhile. And it's what steel's doing to save a suspension bridge, talking to uh, Natasha and sees that how everyone else kind of pitches and beat and is a hero. It it doesn't take just one hero. It takes millions of them. And then the last issue, Gretel issue eight. um, I go back to the beginning. Jesus, save me. (sighs) Ah, We have Clark battling the, you know, battling. Glenn Morgan's having a nervous breakdown. He keeps battling the, the collector, who's very much like a centipede or or something. He's he's almost insect like. 
Yeah, he's like an insect. Like I said, he's like a proto brainiac, basically, because the term brainiac gets dropped here. When the alien intellectual brain interactive system is a collector of planetary. Um, why can't I pronounce that? Yeah, I was like, why can't I pronounce that word right now? Are you kidding? Brainiac? Write that down, Olson. Glenn Morgan has a mental breakdown yelling about the bartender. And then we get this really weird shot of Clark battling. Don't stop. I don't give up. He takes down Metallo. Metallo backhands him, and we see the suit is a little white again. But then we see him saying no, 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 as people get fl- like one of the jars break. And then it says, that's it, no more. And it's like him in completely different suits. Colors and patterns and everything. And he's holding like a spear. And then he flings it at the collector. And like I said, I think that all pays off later when some things are revealed to us. That's kind of what I wanted to try to get through all the Grant Morrison run at once, but... But he starts taking on the collector and he basically talks about a speeding bullet and he throws the ship at him that's shrunk like a bullet and takes him down. And the ship basically makes like a chrysalis crystal cocoon. And then he stands in the sun and he heals and he goes, huh, as he's now on the collector's ship. Right. Yeah, it's like, the, the bubbles go from being green Brainiac speech to being the ship speech in blue. So it's like the the ship takes over the Brainiac systems and takes over his whole ship. Or at we least see, this, this, this collection house. We see Dr. Irons being interviewed by Jimmy, asking if he thinks he's a superhero. Glenn Morgan wants to talk to someone. Lex is trying to get away. Then we see the Daily Planet and the Daily Star. And we learn that George Taylor had a new the the Kents. Um, and it feels like the only people that work at the Daily Star is like George Taylor and Clark. And then um uh what do you call it? We see Clark back at his apartment and we learn that Icarus who he was talking to is actually Lex Luthor and they're kind of actually working together without knowing it we see that um, John Corbin's alive and then we get Clark on the roof with his landlady I actually like the way he drew Clark here in the top left corner And so she says, basically, you're a good boy. Your secret's safe with me. And then you turn the page, and I'm like, what is this? Like, the art is completely different. He's getting the key to the city. And it was just, it was kind of jarring. And then we see him at like his parents' grave. And then, what is this? <laughs> I don't know what that is. And then we see him, yeah. you know, he's on the ship staring off. And then we have an epilogue of a dude hunting a T Rex. And that is the first eight issues of Action Comics. Dun, dun, dun. So, yeah. How do you feel about that, James? <laughs> Um, I mean, some of it's pretty, you know, great Grant Morrison storytelling and, and, you know, pulling things back around, uh, telling, getting to see some different stories, uh, having the backups written by, um, uh, Sholly Fish, um, though, you know, especially the iron stuff was pretty good. I like that. Um, I like the uh, the family stuff, um, but yeah, the it's 
you know, it's really cool, but it's also, you know, very Grant Morrison where some of it's really awesome and some of it's really out there. Yes. Yes, it is. So, I don't know. You keep reading the issues and I'll read the trades and we'll see how it differs. Okay. (laughs) All right. So, our next reading assignment for our faithful listeners here is going to be um action comics number nine through twelve number zero which i love number zero and annual number one so that's our our next which is volume two and we'll go from there so i i I have a love-hate relationship with grant morrison sometimes like sometimes i think he's really great and then i think he sometimes he over convolutes stories and um yeah he has a he has a very um a very deep uh storytelling uh elements you know like he can do some really great story stuff and then he just starts to delve into this stuff and he's talking all this pseudo science uh type stuff or or higher dimension consciousness type things and then you're like like shoosh sometimes <laughs> yeah you are you're like okay dude but like okay grant good good talking with you pal but lots of great books i mean and he wrote all star i mean that's you know i have a love i have a like love hate relationship i have a love hate relationship with all star too i think I've said it before. I feel like sometimes people um, love that book and just I'm like, there's good parts in it, but I don't, I'm not just over the moon about it. I don't like the way Lois is in the book. Um, And there's just things I'm just like, eh, it's okay. Right. I think, you know, you get a lot of uh, Silver Age stuff in there that people like in a very modern way. And then, um, uh you know you got frank quietly's art which is just his so art's good, good in that book so freaking good so yeah, i think i think overall you know you got some pretty great stuff there yeah i mean i'm not gonna i'm not gonna argue about the art but oh no, really, every, really, every time i read it i'm like okay like I, I go back to it and i'm like all right let's see if i'm missing what am i missing you know and i read it i'm like this is okay i like this here Right. Well, some books just don't ring something in you. You know what I mean? Yeah. And try to convince that to a gajillion fans out there. Oh, and yeah. I mean, because it's not your favorite thing in the world. You're wrong. Mm hmm. <laughs> mm hmm. Yeah. Exactly. Ah, uh, that's it. Okay. All right. Well, good listeners. Thanks for hanging out with James and I. We'll uh, catch you on the flippity flop. That's an office joke. If you listen to The Office. If you watch, watch The Office. The office. <laughs> yeah. I'm too tired. I gotta get out of here. I mean, some people probably just throw it on and it's there and they just listen to it. You know, there, there are shows that I can just hear and I can basically watch it in my head. Mm-hmm. As as it's being played, and I'm sure the office is like that for plenty. Yep. So, this is Dan Jurgens, and if you want to have a good time, keep listening to the Krypton Report. Look up in the sky. We want to thank you for checking out the Krypton Report podcast, and we ask you to check us out on all of our social media: on Twitter X, Facebook, Instagram, Blue Sky, Hive, Threads. YouTube, we're everywhere. And if you want to be a guest on the podcast, just send us a message and let us know. If you are like Tyler and James and can't get enough super talk, check out these other podcasts. Digging for Kryptonite, Supergirl Radio, The Last Sons of Krypton, The Superboy Legacy Podcast, All-Star Superfans, Superman the Animated Podcast, The Aspiring Kryptonians, Always Hold On to Smallville, The Geek of Steel, and Truth justice and hope.